Hello, and welcome to this SOE panel discussion, Leading Through Change. My name is Will Dalrymple. I'm the editor of Transport Engineer and Operations Engineer, which go to members of the IRTE, BES, and IPlanT. Both titles have a free to view website and free email newsletter. Just search on the magazine title. Tonight's webinar is organized by the SOE, Society of Operations Engineers, which serves 16,000 qualified professionals in over 40 countries worldwide. As one of 35 professional engineering institutions in the UK, SOE has the responsibility to support individuals and organizations to operate in safe working environments using modern practices in a technically proficient way. The society is licensed by both the Engineering Council and Society for the Environment and use its remit from them to improve the careers of our members and the wider engineering community. Tonight, I'm honored to be joining seven expert panelists to discuss coping with modern times, basically. We recognize that businesses have been forced to completely rethink their strategy during the global pandemic, while also dealing with the changes brought about by Brexit. For many, this has meant completely reworking their strategy and mitigating huge operational challenges. Also, I'm sorry to say that Mark Russell of Plant Risk Services couldn't be with us here tonight, but I'm sure you will agree that our panel represents the cream of the crop of the UK manufacturing industry and transport. And it's transport where I would like to start tonight. Our first speaker is Ian Foster, Group Engineering Director for Comfort Delgro in the UK, which includes TFL operator Metroline in London, West Bus Coaches in Heathrow, and NAT buses. Ian, uh, during the pandemic, bus operators had to, had to adopt to changing requirements. What were the key forces in the balancing act and how have these influenced your day-to-day -day operations? Good evening, everyone. Um, it's, it's quite ironic that the pandemic happened immediately after it appeared that Brexit was um, on its way to being settled. So for us, um, some of the preparations we've made for Brexit have actually stood us in good stead for what's happened subsequently um, during the whole of the pandemic. Sadly, I must, I must first say that um, my company and several companies in London lost a considerable number of staff for which um, we're extremely sorry, of course, and, and we, they're, they're in our thoughts all the time. Um, that has driven other changes subsequently. But at the beginning uh, of the pandemic, as everything shut down in the country, we stayed open. TfL absolutely insisted before the government was directing, was insisted that we stayed open to help get key workers in and out of their uh, places of work. And with that came other challenges um, because obviously our staff started going down with, with the uh, virus um, our suppliers were closing. Um, we weren't sure who could support us and who couldn't support us. So logistically, um, we swung into action with uh, quite a bit of our Brexit plan. We'd increased stock across the whole business. We'd incre increased our diesel holdings in case something happened during the, uh, uh, the Brexit process. Um, and that immediately gave us the comfort that we could continue in business for for several days if everything had stopped. Um, what was more of a hit at the beginning was when the government told staff to start working from home. Now, obviously within our business, the same as many of the other businesses, there are there were probably a, a, a personnel that was set up to work from home, um, but uh, our IT department had to react in terms of trying to source computers and bring equipment into people's houses to allow the day-to-day -day operations to continue. And, and that's refined itself over the uh, ensuing period. And I would say that the uh, ability of us to conference and to, and to work from home is extremely um, slick now compared to the start, uh, start of the situation. More um, pertinent was the, as soon as we saw that the pandemic was taking hold, we started taking measures to modify our vehicles before general guidance was coming out. So we'd already taken measures to um, uh, close off the uh, speech holes in the assault screens on our buses, um, started to enhance cleaning, and we've got pretty, 
pretty thorough cleaning room, but that with the introduction of antiviral sprays, that was ramped up. Um, our operations team were looking at focusing on routes where the most uh, passengers were being carried. Uh, there was lots of uh, worries from our staff about the amount of people getting on the bus and drivers weren't food safe. So there was the risk assessments that were being done on that. And unfortunately at the time, a lot of the evidence from government focused on the fact that the scientists said the virus couldn't be spread in certain ways, which subsequently turned out to be incorrect. So in the meantime, we've had passenger limitation on our buses in London. We had front door, uh, board, uh, sorry, middle door boarding only as other processes were put, put in place. The cabs have been completely sealed off for the drivers. So they're in their own kind of environment with fresh air coming in. So they are segregated from the passengers. And TfL has driven the uh, maximum amount of passengers we can carry on board. Within that, my team, the engineering team, have carried on working as normal. Um, we brought ro rosters in for the managers to come in, the assistant managers and other people to come into the business. But the senior management team has been on site every day since the pandemic started because we thought it's very important that we set an example to our staff that we were there with them throughout this process. And a lot of things were difficult, have become much more, matter of fact, much more daily um, occurrences. And, and again, there's a political impact on this because the mayor wanted to bring the, shut the businesses down a bit. The government wanted to open up a bit. So there was a conflict over funding. Um, but throughout this, we've had excellent support from TfL and some of the changes that brought in clearly wouldn't have been built in by our private businesses up in outside of London because London's funding what's going on. And our businesses in um, uh, the coach business closed immediately because there was no support for the coach business. But subsequently, we've adapted and um, moved more into the school transport sector, which has brought some of those uh, businesses back, some part of that business back into operation. Certainly, we've got revenue coming in now, and a lot of coach operators have got nothing. And in, a, and in AAT, we've worked very closely with work government to provide services when they've asked for it um, and when they've actually supported us in putting those services on. So I think it's been a lot, much more cooperation between the um, government agencies in certain areas and other areas like MOT testing, which stopped immediately and didn't didn't open back up for several months, caused a huge amount of inconvenience to the whole sector. Um, and if there's a criticism of anyone, my criticism has been of that particular government agency that didn't um, didn't quite have the measures in place to allow them to keep keep staff coming in to keep the testing stations running. But as I say, I'm, obviously I don't overrun my time, but it's been a time of great adaptation in everything that we do. Brilliant, Ian. Th thanks very much for um, uh, a great opening statement. Um, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to come back to some, some of those themes. Um, uh, but for now, I'd like to turn to Martin McVicker, um, CEO and co-founder of CombiLift, um, the Ulster-based manufacturer of manual, hand manual handling equipment. He started the business in 1998, and it has since grown to 650 employees. Uh, Martin, um, Northern Ireland might be considered as the ground zero of Brexit, as it is caught between a national and an EU border on one side and the Irish Sea on the other. Being a manufacturer there must be doubly hard after the expiry of the transition period at the end of last year. What, it is, like, what is it like there at the moment and how has your business changed over the last five years since the Brexit referendum? Yeah, and, and I think a very good question. So good evening, everyone, and, and, and uh, thanks for, for, for inviting me along here this evening. Um, so for CombiLift, we, we manufacture material handling equipment we're actually based in County Monaghan. So we're actually just south of the border with Northern Ireland. Um, and 50 of our employees actually live in Northern Ireland and the remainder are in the Republic of Ireland. So whenever the Brexit vote took place back in June 2016, okay, it was a concern for our business, maybe, you know, what repercussions it might have. But our first concern was for our employees that live in Northern Ireland traveling across the border. And of course, there's many other concerns, but... I would say from a business perspective, the, the outcome of Brexit was very much a positive out. It was the most positive outcome from a Brexit a scenario for a business like us. And for a couple of reasons, one is the UK is our number one export or home market, we would say. 
And because there's been agreement made with Europe, there's no tariffs being imposed on our products going to our customers in the UK. There's free movement of people on the island of Ireland so our employees can travel north and south freely to work. So it very much solved the two main concerns. But of course, as you can imagine, Brexit has brought a lot of concerns to businesses in the UK and, and elsewhere, very much in terms of the customs documentation that's necessary. So one of the preparations we, we undertook about three years ago, we applied with the revenue or the customs authority uh, to become what's called an authorized economic operator. It's called AEO status. And we got that approved in, in, in 2019. And with that approval, it means that from a customs perspective, our goods travel across a customs border more freely than a company that does not have AEO status. So with AEO status in the UK, I think it was at the end of, two, uh, uh, sorry, in July 2020, only about 1,500 companies in the UK have AEO status, while in Germany there's like 7,000. And I think just as that probably shows that from a UK perspective, there's a lot of our suppliers in the UK were not fully prepared for Brexit in terms of custom declaration, et cetera. So when we're shipping our product, we made a decision on January 1, when we're shipping our products to the UK, we deliver them DDP, which is duty paid. So our customers in the UK don't have any customs clearance to do. We registered for UK VAT. So the only difference they see is they're paying VAT mm -hmm. and they can claim it back. We just wanted to make the process as seamless as possible. And in fact, we've 80 suppliers in mainland UK. And of them 80 suppliers, we found it quite challenging for the first few months. You know, they weren't all organized for Brexit. And we actually changed our terms of them to, to X works. And we actually organized the customs clearance. So we found that was our most successful way to keep a, a solid flow to the supply chain. Because as we know, for any business, you know, that's really been it's, it's the supply chain. But also it has brought some additional transport cost. But for us as a company, you know, because of the, the scenario with Brexit and, you know, and the compounding of COVID, the demand for warehouse space has never been at such a premium. So in the UK market and across many European countries, warehouses are, have, were all filled up prior to Brexit. Then COVID sort of PPE gear and several other. So warehouse space has been at such a premium and that has created a massive demand for our products because what's unique about our forklift vehicles, they work in small aisles, maximize customers' warehouse space. So for us as a business, we've never been busier. Our order intake this year is 30% higher for the first quarter than it was in the quarter before the pandemic. So it's it's been positive from a business, but challenging in many ways. And some of the scenarios, you know, from 18th of January this year, we introduced serial COVID testing in our plant. So all our 650 employees, we test them weekly. We set up using a saliva-based test. And with that saliva-based test, we send it to a laboratory and we get a PCR result weekly. It's sent by SMS message to all our employees. So we've had to put a lot of investment to, to keep the business operating, but at least that gives hopefully some introduction there in anyway, Wales. Thanks very much, Martin. Apologies for getting the um, the geography wrong. Um, <laughs> um, no, don't worry. It's, it, you know what? For us, the UK is our home market, but we're in we're just south of the border, so it's all home to us. No, no issue there. I think one thing that's that's remarkable about your comments and, and Ian's just there was the degree of preparation that was possible in a, a rapidly evolving situation. And as you as you, as you you say, Martin, in the run up to to Brexit, uh, there was a long time of preparation, and the fact that you. Uh, applied three years three years ago to be uh, an AEO um, is, is, has certainly uh, proven the benefits. Um, so th thanks very much for that. So preparation uh, there uh, in both cases, a, a key factor coming out already. Um, so um, next up is Sir John Parker, the patron of the SOE. Uh, he's chairman of Lang of Work, the construction firm, uh, and a non-executive director of Carnival Corporation, and a former chairman of Anglo-American and president of the Royal Academy of Engineering. He has said, Leadership is a privilege, even in a crisis. Leaders need to be visible and there for their people. 
but at the same time, leaders are not immune to the pressure of people's expectations, particularly during periods of turbulence. Employees, partners, stakeholders, and clients look to leaders to take charge to provide clarity, connection, and accountability. So, Sir John, what role should leadership play in times of change? Well, a very good evening to everyone and to our panelists. <clears throat> I think, first of all, I would say that all crises um, involve strong leadership to get it right. Uh, all crises involve change, uh, and sometimes on a pretty massive scale. Uh, I've been through a few in different sectors, um, and, but there's been no playbook certainly written for this one. Um, and, but nevertheless, a great deal of the rules or priorities that I've found in the past certainly have applied here. I think in every crisis that I've been involved in, and particularly this one, action this day is an absolute critical. Um, you have no time for paralysis through analysis. Um, it's got to be an immediate focus on liquidity, cash preservation, and survival in some cases. And often it's a question of how long can you survive with the action you're taking before your market may turn up or demand turns up. And then there's inevitably in that change a massive amount of cost out. Uh, but also it has to be taken out in a way that leaves your company in a more co competitive position when you emerge from the crisis. And the other lesson I think is that boards need to be meet very urgently and indeed often. And I'll give you an example from Carnival Corporation where we had 105 cruise ships and suddenly zero revenue. 130,000 employees, zero revenue. 80 odd thousand of those employees come from about 40 nations around the world and virtually no air transport uh, available to get them home. So we had actually to suddenly transfer those number of uh, officers and crew in our own cruise ships uh, across the world, which was an absolute major logistics logistical effort. So, um, but, and then uh, what do you do with your existing fleet? Well, with 105 ships, I think we have now around 90. We sold a number of older ships. We scrapped a number of older ships to modernize the fleet. So it would be in a more efficient state when it emerged from the crisis. And uh, the board met every single week. Uh, and we're, we're still meeting, but now we've just changed it to fortnightly because liquidity management in that situation is absolutely critical. Because in the 90 ships we have today, we have still 13,000 people on board, uh, keeping those ships in a condition where they can be preserved in good condition, ready to sail again. So um, the, the other, of course, coming back to liquidity, uh, we've had to raise on the market something over $10 billion uh, in order to ensure that we have long-term survival. Uh, and right now, <clears throat> fortunately, we see that the demand is again rising and bookings are coming in for the second half of 21 quite strongly, but particularly stronger in 22 than they, we, they were even in 2019. So I think that uh, the crisis will pass. Vaccination is a big step forward, um, and, but taking all necessary steps along the line that Martin was talking about with employees, making sure your crew are tested on a very regular basis if they haven't been vaccinated. And we are also starting some of our early cruises for vaccination only passengers. So I think that's just, uh, an over, overview of uh, some of the elements uh, that are uh, almost inevitably deployed in every crisis and particularly on this particular example which is the most severe that I have certainly ever experienced. Thank you all. Thanks very much Sir John. It's really interesting how you mentioned that you were both looking 
looking at the present moment and also looking with an eye to the future, not only to the immediate future, but uh, but but also farther along. And I'm, I'm pleased to hear that um, the future is looking uh, looking better and looking stronger. Um, uh, now I would like to turn to Stacy Truin, um, Group Managing Director of FCR Filter Control. After joining the company as sales manager in 2006, she became MD uh, of one of the divisions, uh, one of the later divisions, Filtration Control Solutions, two years later, and Group Managing Director in 2014 of the corporate parent FCL organization. Um, so Stacy, your company supplies fluids to heavy industry, including transport. Um, many bus fleets, of course, as we've heard from Ian, uh, were heavily restricted, uh, coach fleets um, even worse, uh, for months, uh, uh, even most of last year. How did your organization, a supplier to these customers, have to embrace change and capitalize on opportunities through diversification? Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Um, yes, indeed. Um, our company, which was established in 1988, and has now four companies under the umbrella organization. Uh, our core products are filters, batteries, uh, lubricants, coolants, AdBlue, um, all for uh, mainly the UK bus and rail sector. So we took two approaches, um, slightly before and at the start of the pandemic, uh, we looked to diversify our product range but also to fast track the development um, of existing HVAC products to improve air quality, which we knew would be in demand during and after the pandemic. So last February, we introduced hand sanitizer to our range. We worked with three manufacturers in the UK to distribute really what ended up being uh, 150,000 litres of hand sanitizer in the first couple of months of the pandemic, um, mainly for the transport sector, but also opened the doors for us in the, in the healthcare sector as well. In addition to hand sanitizer, uh, through our network of uh, suppliers in China, we were able to source face masks um, uh, from an improved whitelist manufacturer and import these quickly um, to provide uh, to our existing customers. Interestingly enough, through word of mouth, we were then approached by uh, an NHS trust in the Northeast, um, which we supported with surgical face masks, uh, another critical PPE, and another three NHS trusts in the UK, uh, until the supply chain was able to deliver to those trusts directly in July. Um, but at the same time, we are a manufacturer and for many years um, we have manufactured HVAC filters. Um, by April, in terms of our core business, uh, sales had dropped by 30% almost immediately after lockdown um, as the transport operations reduced. Uh, our sales of PPA did provide an infill for us uh, to these sales, but we also recognise that we needed uh, we, we had an opportunity to fast forward uh, the development of our HVAC filters to improve air quality. At the same time, we were approached by Bombardier, who asked us to look at developing, in collaboration with their global engineering team, uh, antiviral HVAC filters. Um, so between March and October, we've been developing the pathogen eliminating particulate air filters, or PEPA. For short, we started our first field trials in October. We're now seeing UK wide rollout in the bus and coach industry. And we have 20 trials ongoing in cities such as New York, Atlanta, Toronto, uh, Melbourne, Singapore. And in April, we start our first antiviral HVAC, um, HVAC trials in buildings. That's that's amazing. Um, you had you'd planned this all along. It's just was it a matter of accelerating um, rather than uh, being completely new? Um, so air quality has always been a strategy for us. Um, we identified that we needed to develop our HVAC filters and look at air quality. But really, a lot of our R and D um, was looking at reducing knocks, knocks and socks, 
um, and various other technologies um, to create a better um, cabin air for both uh, rail and, and bus. The antiviral element really came about at the start of the pandemic when we were approached by Bombardier, um, who asked us to look at various ways that we can either increase the efficiency of our existing filters um, or by the use of additives, which is what we've actually uh, now done and achieved, uh, created the antiviral properties of that. So yes, it was it was certainly a, a working project, but uh, the pandemic, we recognised we needed to, to really speed up those efforts. And we were really only able to do it um, with almost drawing on the expertise of uh, working in collaboration with Bombardier and their uh, engineers from around the world. Um, obviously, a terrible, uh, terrible context, but uh, what what an amazing story. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so staying within the transport industry, then I'd like to turn to um, the UK, uh, uh, Scottish, even trailer manufacturer, Gray & Adams. Uh, Ian Smith is with us tonight, the, its group engineering manager. He has more than 40 years experience in the commercial vehicle industry um, and employment. his employment history covers a large spectrum, including re inspection, repair and maintenance, legislative, manufacturing, mechanical engineering and senior management. So Ian, how did Grain Adams sustain high levels of customer service in after sales support um, during, uh, during Brexit and, and COVID and all of these various crises we've been hearing about? Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to, um, uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, what, a, what a couple of years it's been, 18 months to two years, it's been, uh, we, you know, from, a, from a, manu a manufacturing perspective, we are, uh, had the run-up to uh, the Brexit um, and the transition period, uh, which we were well prepared for uh, in terms of materials uh, for build, uh, legislation type approval, uh, which was a, a fairly uh, fairly large um, challenge uh, in itself, and it's uh, really uh, all been around preparedness. Um, uh, and we were at that particular point. I go back to uh, um, uh, early uh, early last year that we thought we're fine. We've got everything under control. We've brought in some uh, some extra supplies and stocks. To see if uh, over as the transition period or what was going to happen with, with Brexit. Then, of course, um, COVID uh, uh, struck. Um, now, uh, the the, uh, the senior management um, was all about the senior management involvement uh, um, and taking positive uh, leading action, uh, looking at various options as uh, scenarios changed in March. Um, it, it managed to keep our, our business going. Now, we actually shut down uh, just late, same as everybody else did in, in late uh, late March. But um, everybody was saying, no, where well, you could work from home, the, uh, um, uh, the, the infrastructure for doing that, your computers, telephones, uh, to keep our customers uh, in contact with ourselves were all put in place. So it was a big investment uh, um, in time and effort to try and get... Uh, um, uh, the supporting element uh, into place, but we fairly quickly um, through good leader, uh, good leadership, uh, and, and uh, constant uh, um, uh, board meetings to, to look at strategies and ways forward, of the, uh, especially the changing policies, not only between uh, ourselves, uh, the United Kingdom, but Scotland and England were different, uh, as was uh, various other uh, uh, countries. But we managed to get back uh, back into the factory within a month um, of uh, COVID um, uh, striking, really. And it wasn't uh, our, our output uh, was, was certainly heavily reduced, uh, which meant delays to our customers. Uh, um, the interim period, uh, while we were all working from home, we were able to uh, uh, sustain some uh, some good um, support. Uh, through a network, uh, uh, a network of uh, after, after sales care. So there's a there's a lot of um, uh, to put that into place. We have to make sure that our people were protected, and that's the, that's the, that was the key is making sure 
uh, our staff are protected uh, um, and adapted to that, that sort of environment. So we utilize national support networks wherever possible, um, especially for proprietary uh, parts and systems like axles uh, and tailors and, and, and braking and fridges, uh, uh, as an example. Of course, um, the, the, the industry, uh, while they were screaming out for, for, for vehicles um, uh, and adaptive vehicles, there was this thing about temperature controlled and, and the vaccine. And there was lots of things going on. Um, but our, our customers uh, had empathy and we had empathy with that. So they understood some of the delays that we were going to uh, go, go, going through. So, um, you know, we, we, we uh, as we went through the COVID uh, uh, situation, uh, we actually um, do um, development and, and testing within the factory uh, and, and bringing strategic return to work policy uh, into the factory. By the time uh, July came uh, last year, we were up to about 98% uh, production, which was a fantastic effort by everybody, by all the staff, uh, by all the senior management team um, to allow us to do, to do that. So um, we managed to, to work our way through COVID uh, and that was fairly, fairly well understood. Of course, we came to the end, uh, coming towards the end of the transition period, and we started to wonder uh, um, what, what that was going to look like. So uh, look, nobody knew what, again, in terms of, uh, our, especially our business in Northern Ireland, uh, cross-border trade, uh, the, the um, uh, Brexit, you know, what was what was going to be qualifying goods? How, how would we sustain uh, and, um, production in, in Northern Ireland from, from our factory here uh, in North of Scotland? But um, we, we managed to uh, we managed to do that. I mean, there was changes, uh, and, and trying to understand things like the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, which played a big part in our type approval um, uh, understanding and, and gave us some uh, some leeway. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to say, that's pretty much uh, where we were. Yeah. Much. It's lots of different things uh, there. Uh, again, hopefully we can get onto some of those points in more detail uh, in in a few minutes. Turning now to the views of other manufacturers, um, uh, and that's going to be through our next speaker, Margaret Renshaw, who is Senior HR Consultant at Make UK, the manufacturers organization formerly known as EEF, formerly known as Engineering Employers Federation. She has over 20 years experience in all areas of HR management and has been delivering major HR strategy and organizational change management projects for much of that time. Prior to joining Make UK, she joined. She gained experience in manufacturing, public, nonprofit, and retail sectors. So, um, Make UK represents and supports manufacturers, um, and we've we've been hearing about some of the fantastic cases of entrepreneurship um, in the pandemic. Could you broaden our uh, our, our 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 expertise, our understanding, um, and then highlight some other examples um, that you've heard about? Hi, thanks, Will. Hi, thanks, everyone. Yes, um, what I'd say is um, Make UK, and as Will said there, formerly EEF, etc. we have around 4,000 members, so 4,000 manufacturing engineering members. So we do hear things. We're out there both locally, regionally, and, and on a national level as well. So we get to hear what's going on, what things people have been working on. And also we make connections between members who may be struggling, and, and particularly over the last year, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a few um, member companies who were struggling for supplies. You know, they probably were suppliers of end user products, whereas some manufacturers couldn't hold, get hold of raw materials. So they turned from manufacturer to supplier. Um, there's a couple of examples from the fashion industry, funnily enough. Um, here in Derbyshire, we've got a company who manufacture high-end ladies' lingerie and, and fashion items, but they turned their machines and their teams into actually um, pattern drafting and cutting and making PPE for the NHS and the care sector. Uh, we have another company in Coventry who, when you think about nebulizers for asthma sufferers, they got involved in 
um, prototypes of things similar to that when COVID was was at the beginning, and also prototype that to go into hospitals where people were suffering from the breathing difficulties and, and respiratory difficulties. And that was something that hospitals could provide to patients on an individual basis. So I, th I think everybody's rallied round. Um, turning from supplier, you know, and, and things like that made a huge difference. And I think the fact that we keep our ear to the ground, as I say, on a local basis, on a regional basis as well, we have what they call regional advisory boards. So that's groups of um, MDs, FDs, etc. at C-suite will meet with some of our regional directors and they'll talk about what the real issues and challenges they're having from a manufacturing viewpoint and, and what we can do to help and where we can actually start to influence and influence at a national level by, you know, talking to Department of Trade and Industry, etc., and putting the viewpoint of manufacturers generally in the right arenas so that we can influence some of the policies that come out that can actually support the difficult times and challenges that our colleagues and our members are suffering from. You know, things like the Brexit um, angle as, as well as anything else. So it's been challenging all around, I think, for manufacturing. It's one of those industries where the majority of people have been engaged in different types of work. So different types of work to try and support the community as much as anything else. Well, um, you mentioned there, uh, Margaret, that they were struggling for supplies. Um, uh, it's one, one struggle and there are so many different kinds of struggles. I wonder what, what's fought for preeminence? Um, is it about the lack of market? Uh, for, um, of, of, is it about the lack of supply? Is it about people and getting people into factories to be able to do the labor that's required? I think to be fair to you, it was a hard product to start with. And then of course you've got the fact that, you know, some people may be on furlough because their business doesn't have the volume of work. They don't have the market to satisfy. And then just working around that and looking at skeleton teams and what skeleton teams can actually produce as well. So again, having a strategy throughout to make sure, you know, it's a fair distribution as well as much as anything else of, you know, being able to keep people in work, actively working. Um, and a lot of the time actually on site as well. So things like, you know, are people comfortable to come on to site, safe site situations? And again, you know, we can support that and we do support that with our health and safety and environmental teams as well, who work very closely with, with members too. Uh, thanks very much. And in fact, we've had a question about um, about uh, staffing issues, um, which I'd like to, to put to everyone, but I want to do that after our last but not least speaker, Jonathan Backhouse, the director of Backhouse Jones Solicitors uh, with his twin brother, James. They are the seventh generation of solicitors in the firm, which began to specialize in road transport law in 1930. Um, which is an amazing heritage. Um, he regularly advises RHA and FTA members and is a frequent speaker at seminars held by associations representing the bus, coach, haulage, and logistics sectors. Uh, so Jonathan, the Brexit transition period and COVID-19 uh, forced many businesses to track uh, regulatory changes to assess compliance and potential claims. In the area of contract reviews, uh, what were the main impacts of the force majeure uh, or pandemic clauses? I think as a, as a starting point, good evening, everybody. Um, most people haven't ever looked at their contracts in years. And so the first thing they have to do is actually find what they'd agree, dust it off and find out if there was anything in there that helped them. And um, often, unfortunately for many businesses, uh, force majeure clauses, which are a fairly standard clause in many contracts, weren't there because they hadn't really thought about that as an issue. Um, a lot of medium-sized and smaller businesses barely even rely on contracts in a written format. And so the support that they required uh, at the moment where they began to realise that they weren't going to be able to satisfy the contractual obligations, um, uh, they have to fall back on something called common law. And uh, common law is effectively looking back at the historic position legally 
through case law and establishing uh, what the rule is. And the rule in case law is, is actually quite strict. It's you, you can effectively call the contract frustrated and therefore avoid your responsibilities if you cannot perform it and cannot is looked at in the circumstances. So whilst you might think common sense would say, well, the government has told us we're in lockdown, so we cannot perform this contract. Um, well, why can you not perform it? Can you not perform it because you've chosen to furlough half your staff? And in those circumstances, that's a choice. That isn't actually the reason you cannot uh, perform your contract. And so people are finding themselves in, in difficult situations, really on the grounds that they didn't actually have a contract that dealt with a pandemic in the way that it needed to. And just to give you a really simple example uh, uh, that you'll all be fairly familiar with, business interruption insurance clauses and contracts, uh, let's face it, they weren't really fit for purpose. Uh, here we were with a major pandemic, obvious business interruption for almost everybody. Even we had the business interruption uh, insurance contract in our uh, legal practice. Um, to be honest, I've not looked at it yet in enough detail. I've no idea whether we can benefit from it. Uh, but the, the long and the short of it is that's where everybody was. And the insurance companies were immediately putting a line under the uh, contracts and saying, effectively, unless it absolutely says uh, in words that if you're shut down because of government policies relating to a pandemic, um, uh, unless those sorts of wordings were in place, they weren't going to honour any contracts unless they were forced to do so. Um, fortunately, uh, an expedited protocol has meant they have been forced to start properly honouring agreements which are more loosely drafted. But that's taken some time and certainly was no great help to people at the time. Um, if you had a force majeure contract, you were probably able to rely on it. They are fairly common and were fairly broadly drafted historically. Um, but other sorts of uh, 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 terms, if you like, that nobody's really thought about were, for example, business suspension contracts. So as, for example, Ian was talking about with regard to manufacturing, it wasn't so much that they weren't going to be able to perform the contract, it was the time scales. They needed time, they needed to be able to pull it together. And right at the beginning, everybody needed to understand what was happening. Now, we found a lot of businesses were pragmatic and, uh, and actually wanted to work with each other to find solutions, which I think actually, in the end, was probably the best policy for any business to take in this pandemic. But um, in the future, I think people will be looking for things like suspension clauses. So can we have a clause that will enable us to suspend the contract for a period of time, uh, but not lose the contract and not fall out over it while something like a pandemic uh, balances out? Um, and a lot of organisations, particularly in the haulage sector, so we've heard for example, that the uh, coaching sector was on its knees, and it was, and still is, very tragically. But in the haulage sector, they started off thinking, right, let's furlough the whole workforce, let's save as much money as we can, which, let's face it, a lot of businesses did and, and had to do, uh, because they didn't know what was going to happen next. However, uh, they very quickly began to realise in the haulage sector that they could either diversify or the fact that the sector they were in was booming. So a lot of haulage picked up a lot of work very quickly or diversified into a lot of work very quickly. And so they were suddenly um, not actually able to perform contracts or not perform contracts because of the pandemic uh, stopping them, but they weren't able to perform contacts because they were getting so much work, they couldn't actually find enough workers to do the work. They couldn't find drivers, they couldn't fulfill just through sheer volume and demand. And so there was a lot of help in connecting haulage companies. So a haulage company that may have done something with the leisure sector or the drink sector, which was suddenly getting no work, could diversify into delivering, for example, as Stacy was talking about, into a totally different sector, the medical sector, or allow their workforce to go work in that sector. Um, and, uh, and so we saw uh, real opportunities there. What I would say, though, is the very sad fact is that some sectors, like the coaching sector, received virtually no assistance directly 
aren't considered critical for the UK and therefore got no specific help. They, obviously, they got furlough and they were able to apply for symbols and bounce backs if they were eligible, but they didn't get any specific help to help them survive. And those sectors really struggled with the personal guarantees that those smaller businessmen and women have to sign in order to buy a coach or three coaches or 10 coaches or 20 coaches. And very tragically, uh, particularly after the sort of first lull, a lot of people were lose, losing houses and, and really seeing catastrophic impact of clauses that they never thought would impact them because they had really good businesses. So a personal guarantee um, uh, wasn't being implemented because your business was poor or, the, or your business plan was poor. It was being implemented because the government had turned off your business and you weren't able to turn it back on. And so suddenly all the credit companies on those vehicles were turning to those people and saying, I'm really sorry, we are taking your vehicle back. And what's more, we're taking your house. Uh, and that's the true tragedy uh, of the clauses that you're signing. Um, so they don't, they don't necessarily bite for the reasons that you think they're going to bite when you sign the clause. So a lot of learning on clauses, a lot of learning on negotiation around clauses. Um, but I also think so far, many businesses in, in the pandemic have tried to talk to each other and help each other out. And I think actually they should be applauded. The industry should be applauded. Um, we should actually have um, a round of applause from the whole country for business, particularly small and medium business, um, who've absolutely battled through this pandemic and, and, and uh, saved a lot of people's jobs and a lot of people's livelihoods. Jonathan, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to uh, now open up the the forum for questions. Uh, so far, I've had a couple of questions from the audience, and I would really like you guys to ask um, loads more. Uh, for now, I'd like to uh, turn to one of the first question we had, um, which is about uh, you, you mentioned furlough uh, there, Jonathan. Um, uh, the question is: When staff are laid off for long periods, how difficult is it to get them back afterwards? Um, we've we've heard that. Um, uh, that uh, there are uh, there, there's been the furlough uh, that, that's coming to coming to an end fairly soon. Um, many of you panelists have mentioned that uh, that you've used furloughs um, and found other things for your uh, for your employees to do. Um, can I ask? Uh, would anyone like to take anyone like to take this this question on first? Um, um, uh, Ian Smith, could I ask you to, uh, could I volunteer you to talk about uh, how you have dealt with uh, uh, staff furloughs and getting people back and how that's, how that's worked for you? Yeah, it's a, an interesting, interesting thing. Uh, one of the, the, the key uh, thought processes from, from our business was uh, looking at fade. So it was very important to try and get the uh, try and get our staff back uh, obviously as quickly as possible to reduce that uh, um, uh, the, the possibility of skill fade. Um, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, the staff, you know, from a mental uh, perspective as well, a lot of our staff wanted to come back. They they, they missed the uh, the factory, the shop floor, the comradeship. So it wasn't a difficult, uh, really a difficult process of, of, of enticing them back, uh, almost volunteering, can we come back, can we come back? But it's, it's mainly, uh, from, a, from a business perspective, it was definitely uh, about retaining skills. Brilliant, thank you. Jonathan, would you like to add something? I would say there were three categories, um, and, and um, uh, I'm thinking off the top of my head of the numbers, but I think there's about three categories of staff. There's very much the case that a lot of employees were in Ian's category, wanting to come back to work, wanting to be in work after the first few months, which apparently, which I say apparently I was working, but which were very sunny. I think people enjoyed a bit of holiday. Uh, uh, you know, I think they did. It was a nightmare for everybody, but I think a lot of people did enjoy the first few weeks. But um, we probably the biggest single challenge in law in the in the last 12 months has been our employment department flat out answering questions on furlough. And we have these three categories. The first category, are the people keen to come back and really wanting to come back. Um, the second category were people who just 
uh, effectively do as they're told, but are concerned about their own health um, and uh, are concerned uh, about catching the disease. And so they don't necessarily want to uh, not want to come back but they have a higher level of concern than the average employee about the impact of catching the disease. And then you have, uh, I would say, the third category, which is probably where the question is aimed, uh, and that's the category of staff who actually like being off and don't want to come back and want to exploit, if you like, furlough for as long as they possibly can. Um, I think that in our experience, uh, that was the lowest category. The, the fewer people were in actually that category, which is very reassuring. But every business that we've looked after has had some people in that category. And um, you can get them back. It's quite simple. You, um, you are their employer. And if you have work for them to do, uh, you can call them back to work. The challenge is health and safety. So the challenge is, have you risk assessed their return to work? And have you risk assessed if they have specific concerns, for example, shielding concerns, or they might just be in an age group that was more susceptible, um, then uh, at that point, you have to ask yourself, what did you do by way of risk assessment? A lot of businesses didn't even know it was compulsory to carry out a COVID risk assessment. So uh, we provided a tremendous amount of assistance for that. But when the question arose, um, I've got so-and-so who doesn't want to come back to work. They've got a daughter with this condition or a husband with that condition or whatever it is. Um, then the starting point is, yes, you can ask them to come back to work. Um, you've got to be fair about it. You haven't got to be doing it in a way that's punishing them because for, you want to pick on them, but you can ask them to come back to work. However, if they have specific concerns, make sure you've addressed it in the risk assessment and discuss that with them. You're obliged to consult with them about the risk assessment methods. In other words, don't give them an excuse to say no. Um, and, uh, and that's how you tackle it. And it can be done professionally and properly and with an open conversation. Because I think a lot of people uh, really needed a tremendous amount of reassurance uh, and a tremendous amount of confidence to return who were in that category. Thanks, Ian Smith. Yeah, just to reiterate that you're exactly right. And, and part of that, uh, gaining that confidence, um, we uh, got a lot of measures in place. Just imagine a factory, social distancing is, is, is quite uh, restrictive uh, on practice. But we created, uh, to try and reassure and eliminate any fears, we created a, a complete uh, employee return to work uh, uh, COVID handbook, which detailed the changes uh, that they would expect or that they would see when they come into the factory, the, uh, the, the, the business expectations of them and our expectations, uh, their expectations of the business to protect them. So it's very, very much uh, a high on our agenda to, to, to alleviate any fears. Uh, thanks very much. Um, if I may ask uh, Sir John to just follow up on that. I mean, we've been talking about the uh, the attitudes of employees and the management of employees, but it sounds like the managers as well have a, a vital role. Again, and perhaps I'm, I don't want to go over old ground here, but do you think that there have been new managerial skills drawn on in this during this difficult time? Uh, I, I think uh, from the board down, we've all had to adapt to new skills. As I said earlier, the playbook for this was certainly not written. So yes, uh, one of the policy issues we certainly put in place early in both uh, Lang O'Rourke and at uh, Carnival was that our employees were absolutely critical and that they had to be cared for uh, in the best possible way and so um, testing has certainly been an issue, trying to accelerate uh, vaccination for critical roles uh, where possible. Uh, it hasn't been easy, um, but all of that uh, has been necessary. But I think, you know, it's amazing in every crisis, employees rise to the challenge. And I'll give you a classical example of a positive outturn. We were building four hospitals for NHS. Uh, the fourth one was due to finish 
around uh, Christmas of uh, uh, this year. And in fact, it was delivered uh, something like uh, eight months early, uh, or at least 350 beds out of the 540 were accelerated to cope with COVID way beyond uh, the possible delivery time. It was eight months early for those 350 beds and the whole hospital itself was finished three months early. So the effort put in by the employees to support the NHS was absolutely amazing. And I give them great credit indeed. Uh, but I think that again, leaders have to be demonstrate that they're caring for their employees uh, and they're doing their utmost to protect them, especially where there are critical jobs that have to continue. I've just had a question in from Tony Cockcroft. Um, what are the views from the panel of managing long COVID effects of staff? And is this a concern? Um, concentration issues, memory loss, and in some case, physical impacts. How great a risk to your businesses uh, is long COVID? Um, can I ask, um, uh, Margaret, can I ask whether Make UK has been looking at this in any kind of way? I think to be fair, we, we have been mindful of this type of thing. Uh, we've had our guys, health and safety guys, looking at things like the audits, etc. But I think long COVID is something that's on our radar. We work with um, occupational health suppliers as well, so getting some feedback. I think the long COVID, for me, it's trying to manage it with the same principles as you would long-term sickness absence, so doing as much as you can, encouraging people, but recognising that when they are coming back to work, it's like a rehabilitation programme. You know, you've got somebody on long term sick, so follow the principles of that rehabilitation. And I think that gives the individual some confidence as well. And I think when you're managing long term, uh, long COVID and then putting it into the long term sick category, it's also being comfortable as a senior management team that your managers are equipped to deal with some of these things as well. You know, they may be not feeling equipped to have those conversations. You know, people are affected not only physically, but psychologically as well. And it's it's good to reach out to um, providers like um, occupational health and even talking to advisors, maybe advisors that we have, or possibly, you know, go to Jonathan's team and talk about what strategies that we can support and help with as well. Uh, that I haven't heard of any that I can talk about personally, you know, just to paraphrase, but that's the, that's how I would approach it and that's how we would look to approach it, to make sure that all the support services are in place and equally the managers feel equipped to have those conversations because, you know, everybody takes responsibility from the MD right the way through but it's the manager that's on the front line and it's the manager that's having those conversations and will have the greatest impact on the first impression of the company and the view they take of getting people back to work, whether they are in key critical roles or they are in support roles, supporting people who are at the front line and doing the key critical work. Thanks very much. Um, turning now to an even longer term issue um, and training apprentices, apprentices um, and skills developments. Um, I, uh, I wonder, uh, Martin, if I might turn to you to talk a little bit about how uh, your apprentices have fared during this time. I think that there's been, in, in some cases, people have had to put their apprentices on furlough just like they put the regular staff on. But, but how does that impact the long term and what are you doing to develop your own skills and talent within the company? I think, Will, that's, that's a very good question because I know even Ian was referring to, you know, the importance of retaining skills. And I know for our business, you know, we made a conscious decision. Maintaining skills and continuing the apprenticeship programs that we have in place was key. And um, we, we annually in the last number of years, we put about 30 people or we, we put 30 additional people through apprenticeships each year. And we made a decision to keep that operating. We, we partner with the local college and of course, because of COVID-19, the college made decisions, you know, at a national level that, you know, the course had to stop because the college, the 
because of COVID restrictions. But we actually changed our apprenticeship uh, structure that the on the job placement, we actually moved it around so that while the college was closed, we kept the on the job, on the job training. So our apprenticeships actually completed on time with no lapse whatsoever, because we felt that was really key. And in fact, when you look at many courses through universities, apprenticeships is, is a great avenue for upskilling, but also even during this pandemic, many businesses with apprenticeships, they did maintain them and roll them out like normal, which I think is going to be key because I think a challenge for all our businesses over the coming years, it's going to be skill shortage because as we all know, there was a shortage of hearing before COVID-19. And for anyone that cut back on, on skills development, it's going to be a real challenge now moving forward. And I'm probably listening to some of the other questions and, and just some additional comments. I think, you know, we were very fortunate in our business in that we didn't, we did put some people on what we'd call more part follow. But I think the one thing that was that I found very valuable is the importance of communicating with all your employees regularly throughout this COVID scenario. And of course, we as a business, traditionally we would have had we would have had quarterly employee meetings where we would have our six or seven hundred employees together, which is which which can't be done. But we made a decision that every month. Um, not to send out a written message, I actually put together a YouTube video link. So make it visual, you know, update the employees where the business is, you know, some of the challenges and what we're doing, you know, with some of the measures we put in place. So we religiously monthly send out a YouTube video link. And because it's on video, all, you know, you, you know, by the amount of people that opens it. So you have a good indication people do look at the video, but when you send something in a text format, you're never sure who's going to read it and are they going to absorb what's in it. So I, I think communication throughout Forlo is really key to encouraging these people back to back to work when we all need them back, really. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, Stacy, can I turn to you? Because um, I, I just picking up on that point of communication, it's really interesting. Um, I myself have been working at home, like lots of people who are um, uh, who are in, uh, I suppose, the kind of um, information field. But of course, there are all kinds of people who cannot work from home. How do you as a, a manufacturer manage these different types of people? Mm -hmm. Some It used to be so simple. Everybody was at the factory every day or in the office every day, and now it is not. Back in 2009, um, we were asked by one of our large groups to um, produce a business continuity plan for swine flu. Fortunately, back in 2009, swine flu didn't um, really amount to anything, but we already had this uh, BCP in place. So at the start of last year, um, when we realized that um, things were escalating with coronavirus, our operations team dug out the, uh, the BCP from swine flu and looked at it and decided that they were going to start implementing uh, some of the uh, steps and the procedures um, that it advised. And we are fortunate that we have um, three units on our site. Uh, we have our office unit, we have our warehouse, two warehousing units. Um, and then one of those is, is uh, attached to our manufacturing unit. So we um, straight away, before we looked at who could work from home and who couldn't work from home, we isolated each individual unit. And so we, we actually imposed our own um, social distancing and stopped uh, any movement between those three units. Then in early March, um, we felt that it was necessary to start to look at improving our IT. Uh, we do outsource our IT department and they came in and helped us upgrade our systems. We moved quite quickly to um, uh, 365 um, and also uh, started to um, educate um, and train um, staff to work from home uh, using the new systems. We equipped everybody with a laptop that could work from home. The biggest issue that we had was that there became in certain areas um, a little bit of animosity almost that um, all of a sudden uh, we sent all of our customer services, all of our purchasing team and anybody that could work from home home, but we had to keep our warehouse and we had to keep our manufacturing unit open. And it was a huge, hugely um, anxious 
time um, that we all experienced in uh, in March and going into April, when we didn't really know exactly how long people would be off, um, working from home, sorry, um, whether or not as a business, we had to look at um, taking on some of the government schemes, furlough, for example, we decided not to. Um, and also to try and continue to motivate those members of staff that were still working from the, uh, the warehouse and working in manufacturing. And that was a huge challenge for the team leaders and also uh, the other directors um, to, to keep uh, morale really, really boosted. Um, but we, we felt that within our business, and I know that uh, within lots of other businesses, we created our own front line. And our front line at the time was keeping our warehouse safe um, and, uh, which, which, and our manufacturing safe, which meant that we could um, continue to be operational. Um, I'd like to, to ask a question about the, the more emotional side of things. Uh, people have been affected in all kinds of ways. Um, and the, in some cases, the boundaries between home life and family life and work life have really shifted over this period. Um, and uh, it's been uh, difficult for parents and difficult for people who've had, uh, who've been personally affected by loved ones becoming sick or, uh, or other issues. Um, perhaps they've been laid off and it's, it's it, the, it's, it's been a difficult time. Um, and I just wonder uh, if uh, you have learned anything about the way you manage your staff and, and what's, what kind of what's worked uh, for you. Um, is there anyone who'd like to take this one? Uh, Jonathan. Um, I, I think there were two lives in the first lockdown. There were the lives of the people who were in work and there were the lives of the people who were furloughed. And um, they were extremely different. Um, certainly uh, all our lawyers were, were in work. They were um, uh, varying degrees of busyness from ridiculously busy for the employment departments. Uh, and when I say ridiculously busy, I'm talking 18 hours a day, 16 to 18 hours a day for about five months nonstop, including weekends, um, that they were bombarded and overwhelmed. Uh, and what you recognised in those people was the development of extreme tiredness, which is quite obvious, to the point where um, uh, I took it as my responsibility to make sure they took time off and significant time off and force them to take time off, force them to take holidays, because the people who work like that, and lawyers are quite common, you get this, they get into a groove and they forget about their, everything other than work. Um, but these are predominantly a female workforce. Law these days is predominantly a female workforce many of whom have children at home, uh, many of whom therefore have a significant amount of outside pressure, not just work, and they're balancing and juggling uh, a ridiculous amount of pressure. But what I was also acutely aware of was a second group, which were the people who were furloughed. Generally, that was in our support group of staff because we couldn't um, enable them quickly enough to work from home because of some of the software we have to use. Uh, to basically protect people's money and things like that. So we weren't able to give them access to working from home. Those people were, and, I, and I'm not being rude, I think my staff are absolutely fantastic, but they were on holiday uh, in essence. And, and they weren't tired, they weren't stressed. And so you had a really conflicting scenario in July when people were coming back to work of people wanting to then take their holidays. And one thing we didn't get right, and I think many businesses failed to do this right, is we didn't force the people on furlough to take enough holiday, actual taking of holiday whilst they were on furlough. So you got to the second half of the year and everybody had virtually a full holiday entitlement. And of course, people have got families, so they want to take their holiday in the summer. Because by then, people thought things were going to be normal from September onwards, something we've all forgotten. So I had an exhausted team and a really refreshed team who don't do the same work, who complement each other in their work, but all wanted to take holiday at the same time. So actually, uh, uh, one thing to do in a business was to recognise, first of all, the signs of exhaustion. And it's very easy to ignore that when you're trying to get a lot of stuff done for a lot of people. And, and, and we were just trying to help a tremendous number of businesses who were desperate, frankly, uh, through these times. And so 
Uh, it was forcing people to take holiday, forcing people to recognize their own well-being. Um, you know, there are groups of people who are very good at coming forwards and saying, I don't feel very well, I feel stressed. But I think they're in the minority. I think the, the vast majority of workers don't do that. I think they ignore their, their own status because they're highly motivated to deliver, certainly in a, in a workforce like mine. And so it was forcing people to recognize they needed breaks, forcing people to take those breaks, uh, making people who were coming back recognize they weren't going to be allowed to take holiday uh, because other people needed holiday uh, and needed a break. And, uh, and then with the odd person who clearly was struggling. And to be fair, I would say the mental health, the, the obvious mental health strugglers actually came from people who were on furlough uh, as much as people who were actually working. Uh, they, they were struggling to deal with the change uh, and, uh, and recognizing that you had to manage that. And the gentleman before who was talking about dialogue with the workforce, videos, talking, uh, and of course, Margaret before was talking about how you manage long-term sickness. Communication is king, and I mean, keep them in the loop. Make sure they 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 know they're valued. Make sure they know that you actually want to help them come back, and you want to do it in a way that they can live with and that you can live with. That is absolutely key, uh, and certainly that's the the challenge. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Ian, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, uh, Jonathan, you just just on the tail end of, of what you're discussing there, you know, um, uh, about being valued, the importance of being valued. Now, it's not about, it wasn't just about people that were on furlough. It was legislation that forced people that can work from home to work from home. So we had, uh, you know, design staff, uh, buyers, uh, anybody that could do their work on a, on a laptop went home. You lose touch uh, with the business. You start to feel uh, uh, not undervalued, but not valued. You, you're, you're not part of the decision-making process. Uh, and it's really, really difficult uh, thing to, to overcome. But that was, that's a, absolutely, it's about making sure you have the contact. And as, as a, certainly as a manager, regular meetings, uh, you know, Zoom calls, uh, Teams calls, how's things, what's happening? And even just for a bit of fun, that, that was key, just to make sure that everybody had retained their sense of humor. Um, brilliant, Ian, thanks very much. Um, I've had a question in um, uh, concerning um, disruptions and disruption planning, um, something that you have all, uh, by virtue of being invited to the panel, have had major experience with. Um, the question reads, it may be too early to say, given that the pandemic is still ongoing, but are there any general lessons learned and preparations that companies have made to better handle any future unexpected major disruptions? Um, is disruption planning a permanent feature of, uh, let's say, uh, business management from now on? Um, Sir John, could I ask you what your views are? Well, I think that business continuity plans will obviously absorb the many lessons that different companies have learned uh, through this pandemic. Um, and I think uh, clearly we've learned to use completely new, or many people have learned to use completely new communication tools. Uh, but uh, my view is the uh, one key lesson is the office is not dead. Um, and I think we have to all think through what suits us and what suits our employees. Um, but I believe we'll probably end up with hybrid solutions because there is no substitute for people getting around a table, looking into each other's eyes um, and, and actually having real debate about innovation, uh, about strategy, etc. And to be honest, uh, you don't get a feel for that uh, through this mechanistic approach. So I think we'll all have to change the way we work uh, and we'll all have to incorporate the lessons we've learned from this into our business continuity planning. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Can I ask you um, whether uh, what, what you feel about um, disruption planning and continuity planning in the future? Yes, thanks, Will. I think the thing is, again, building on what's already been said, I think part of that continuity plan is also looking at the comms, the health and well-being, you know, 
the demographic of your teams as well and, and mm. being aware of where some of the hot spots actually are and you know it's not always about age profiling it's about the the roles that people play you know what what is key you know where are your key players coming from um where are the areas of the business that will be impacted the most and, and again, it's not always the forward facing guys as well. You know, when you're looking at innovation, you're also looking at things that you may want to do differently. And, and one of the things I would say is, is a challenge and particularly a challenge this time around has been some of the technology. Um, I quite agree with what um, Sir John's saying there about there's nothing better than being around a table and, you know, sharing those thoughts and views. And, and you can see through body language how emotive people feel mm. about what's been said. But I also think that we, you know, we've got to look at different ways of that communication and getting people together. Um, I would have said for, for the for the future it's really trying to be aware of what the people plan is and looking at and building in some resilience as well and that may mean that you know some of your teams may have gone on and done the um mental health first aid qualification it may be that you know you've got a lot of managers who've got that that qualification and you've got your quota but are those people in the right areas as well you know, it's great for senior managers and I, and I advocate this a lot that yes, you're part of the team and yes, it starts from the top and, and a lot of the theory is, you know, get your people to buy in and it comes from the top. But what about if you're the only person on site or there's only a couple of people on site and it's somebody, somebody from the, and I'm going to use the old phrase, the shop floor, the front end that's suffering they might never have seen, they might never have had a conversation with you because they've never been in that scenario, you've never been around. How are they going to come to you and talk about what they are suffering? You know, I'm going to go to the MD or I'm going to go to the FD and say, I'm having a bad day or I've got all these pressures at home. I've turned up, but my heart's at home, you know, and I'm going through the, and I need some help. So I think part of the contingency planning is, have we got the people with the right skills across the whole demographic as well? So people have got, you know, you can talk to your colleague, you can talk to a supervisor or a first line manager, because they're the population of people that you interact with on a daily basis. And, and you will be able to be more comfortable in your conversations. And I'm not saying that senior managers don't support because I think they do. And senior managers go through a lot of pain like everyone else, but that's the pain behind the closed door. But I think part and parcel of it is, have we got the right people? Can we approach the right people and ask them to volunteer and give them the support if they're gonna put their hand up and, and do that for the greater good of their colleagues and the business? And also, you know, what other things are in place? You know, have we got employee opinion, I beg your pardon, employee support systems in place, EAPs? It doesn't have to always cost a lot of money, but it's some of the small things, having somebody there on your shift or on your, you know, in your area, in the office, in your functional area that you can go and talk to. And even things like, is there an area that may be the first aid room or somewhere that can be designated for a quiet room so people can take time and maybe obviously tell people where you are first and foremost for the reasons of health and safety. But you go off and you just have a 15 minutes and you just have a, a period of contemplation before you gather your thoughts and come back. But they're the sort of things and the other things as well that I think are really good and we found really, really work, not only to test the water, but to look at what people are wanting and, and, and shouting out for, is employee opinion surveys, just pulse surveys, and, and just looking at what can be built up. And also one of the biggest things is include the workforce in the planning. 
if you are planning for the future, include them because you're investing in them as individuals for their skills and knowledge. And in some cases, their personalities because they make life a little bit easier and it's a little bit less painful. It's, it's the personalities, but don't, don't impose some of the things. Some things are, are given, some things have to be called, you know, there, there has to be corporate governance, but where you can include you know, your colleagues include the workforce in some of those decisions. Brilliant. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Martin, you had your hand up. Yeah, no, and, and it's probably following on from, from Margaret's very good comments there regarding engaging with employees. And, and I know at, early on, Sir John referred to, you know, that the team in our organisations, you know, they really raised to the raised to the bar to meet challenges and, and I think the one thing that I have realized during this pandemic is you know for the employees that you do give some lenience and flexibility you know even employees that maybe had challenges were they taking care of their children while the schools are closed but by giving that little bit of flexibility to employees they come back and repay you in spades so I think that's one really great lesson out of this yeah. And, you know, in terms of, I know for our organization, you know, we've made a decision, we've, we've actually embarking on uh, implementing a management development program because, you know, our managers, we need to upskill them to not just manage people, but really work with people. Everyone's individual, give them that flexibility and, and they, they'll come back and repay the organization. And as opposed to the other, I mean, and, and maybe it may be not just unique to ours, but it may be unique to some businesses. As a company, we were very reliant on trade shows to develop our business, you know, and find new customers over the last number of years. Like to give you stats, in 2019, we exhibited our product at 90 trade shows worldwide across 85 countries. Like that's industry trade shows, and that went to zero. So we really have had to change our focus. And one of the areas we feel if, or we believe is our best way of connecting with our customers is tying up with, with uh, associations of different industries and through societies like the Society of Operations Engineers because we feel that's going to be what people are going to use these platforms to learn from each other in future because, I mean, I'm sure everyone organising trade shows hope it's going to go back the way it is. I personally don't think trade shows are going to be as, as popular as they were. So organisations, we need to find other ways of connecting with our customers and, and, and we feel trade associations is probably one avenue, and of course, through editors and publications as well. So I think there's a great future in, 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 that, in that area. So. Oh, as an editor of a trade publication, I definitely, definitely go along with that latter point. Thanks very much. <laughs> very good. John, carry on. So John, please carry on. No, no, I just said I'm delighted for you. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much. Um, I, I was just going to follow up on the on the question of skills, Martin. Um, and it's it's really great to hear that uh, you um, uh, found that your own company uh, wanted to you wanted to improve the skills of people who are working with with people. Um, that management program that you uh, have planned. Can you tell us a little bit about what sort of thing you're looking to develop in your managers? Well, you know, you know, if you take traditionally, you know, you have there are several management training programs are out there and are very much focused on, on getting managers qualifications. You know, for us, we want our managers to, to really think and, and get all our employees to think that everyone has a customer. You know, that's one of the mindsets we want. You know, it doesn't matter who's working on the shop floor, that product they're assembling or manufacturing is handed to them, their next colleague. So quality at every level is so key. So, you know, it's very much going to be a quality focus, but it's actually offering a management training program that our managers will treat every individual as individuals. You know what? On a production line, everyone is not the same, even though we all set up production lanes and we expect everyone to be the same. But giving the employees that flexibility in terms of giving them the flexibility, you know, to have time with their family when, when they need to. And it's creating, and I, I would call it more, employees floaters so developing that our managers start to think that they don't just run a production lane with x number of employees and expect x to be there every week you know it's trying to run an assembly lane where they've x plus 10 percent to build in that buffer to give employees flexibility 
and, and we feel it might be a little bit of an investment at this early stage, but we feel the skills and maintaining the employees we have is going to be so key to, to grow in our business in future. But we're, we're actually developing the course content around our needs, and we're not just picking an off-the-shelf management training program as such, Will. Well, that's great stuff. I wish you best of luck with that. Um, Stacey, if I can turn to you, um, your story initially uh, was about one about entrepreneurship and diversifying. Um, and I wonder uh, how you feel you might um, carry on with those kinds of initiatives in future. Um, it was a, a terrible set of circumstances that forced you to go down that route, but it sounds like it's going well for you. Do you plan to change anything about the business in order to be able to build on that um, inertia or that uh, momentum now? We're going to particularly change with the business. Um, we have learned a lot. Um, the challenges that have presented themselves over the last 12 months have, have enabled us um, as the, the, the directors to really um, look at our business and um, almost dissect it, see what positives that we can actually glean uh, from the situation that we found ourselves in. And a, a lot of the positives really came about from um, the agility that we had as a, as a business, the resilience um, that, that we realised that our, our, our business had um, under the trying, testing times. Um, but also, whilst um, pre-pandemic, I could say that, you know, we valued our staff. I'm, I'm sure everybody values their staff. But this, this really, um, as an organisation, everybody came together. Um, everybody pulled together and um, we we are getting through it you know uh, we're, we're, we're certainly not out the other side yet um, we don't know what the the future is is going to hold but I don't think we're necessarily going to um, change anything from the business we are fortunate that we have lots of entrepreneurs that work within our organization and I think it's very very key that when some of these great ideas in the early days were sort of coming out um, sometimes from the the most unexpected uh, corners of the office um, I think we need to foster that a little bit more and, and just sort of going back to really what Martin was saying about his management programs just before um, we went into lockdown we were um, we had initiated a, a leadership program for our team leaders, and it's certainly something that even though um, it was a it was a monthly leadership program that that we were we were doing, and we were only into month three uh, of a of a twelve month leadership program, um, we really saw the benefits of that. We really felt that that sort of empowered a lot of our our team leaders. And then when we were all faced uh, with all of this uncertainty and anxiety um, of, of what the future would hold, we certainly noticed that, that a lot of people stepped up. And, and certainly, you know, I, I really want to encourage that more within our organisation, because really when, when the chips were down and people, you know, stepped up, um, and showed entrepreneurial uh, flair and we looked at other products. And so we want to continue with that level of agility in our business and not mm. just be so fixed on our core products um, because we need to. Um, we need to diversify into other products. We need, to, we need to look at other areas that we can grow the business um, so, so certainly, we, there's a lot of lessons, a lot of positivity that's that's come out of a, a fairly awful situation. I think for everybody. Uh, Stacey, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I, mean, I think one of the hard um, points that uh, Jonathan uh, you raised was about the two the two camps, um, the people who were not furloughed and who had to work together to muddle through. Certainly it was a kind of, there was a kind of an esprit de corps um, among them. I, I certainly felt that, but I think the message would have been for some of the people who were furloughed um, was that they were surplus to requirements and were kind of locked out. How do we integrate those people? How do we motivate those people? How do we tell those people that they are still important and bring them into the business? 
dialogue, constant dialogue, keep them in board, keep them uh, informed. None of us knew what was happening in those first few months. We can't pretend we did. We, we sat there waiting for the announcement each day of the week. But one thing we established very early on, which I don't know if any of you were able to take part in, uh, we started giving free webinars because of the sheer scale of the uh, qu queries we were getting on things like furlough. What, what we understood very quickly was nobody actually understood what the government were offering. They couldn't understand R Ricky Hunak's passage. Um, offers what they, how to get hold of them, how to handle it. He was launching things without anything on any websites, uh, coming quickly enough for people to understand. And these people were panicking. So what we did is we launched uh, webinars. Just uh, It was two a week at one point, and then it dropped to one a week. And, and now we, we're still doing them about one a fortnight. Uh, and we were getting uh, so many questions in those webinars. They were taking two to three hours, so we were splitting them into two sections and all sorts of fun. But we were encouraging our own staff, even people on furlough, to listen to them. Uh, so that they felt part of this journey. They felt included. They felt up to date. We have a Teams channel, and thank God my brother forced us to get involved with Office 365 about a year before this pandemic because we all got used to Teams, and we set up a channel called Backlaugh. Okay, everything in our organization has got back in it, and, and it was called Backlaugh. And all it was was jokes, people telling stories, people showing pictures, and this thing continues all day, every day in the background. Most days, probably like many of you, I never get to really look at it. I might look at it at tea time at home or something, but, um, but this Backlaugh channel was so fun. Uh, the directors all made a silly video one weekend where we were throwing glasses of water at each other. Obviously we weren't, we were just doing it on a video and we just sent it to everybody. So just things that made them realize they're still part of the team, and we still want them. And they're doing us a favor by staying at home because we couldn't get them all in because of social distancing, et cetera. And, um, uh, and, and keeping them informed, regular correspondence, regular phone calls, and, and they were appreciative of it. But I think we're really lucky. But I think a lot of us as employers are really lucky. I think we all learned the lesson that our employees the vast majority, if not all of them, love the firm they work for. And you've got to encourage that, you know. That's brilliant, Jonathan. Thanks very much. Um, so I'd, I'd like to, to, to turn this a little bit more to other lessons. Anything else that we haven't haven't brought up the things that we've learned. Um, so many uh, difficult decisions made and uh, so many difficult situations gotten through one way or another. Um, and I'd just like to ask what each of you feel is um, is an important lesson from the past year or so um, that, that that perhaps that hasn't come up. Um, Ian Smith, could I start with you? Sorry to put you on the spot. I think, um, you know, uh, undoubtedly there have been testing times um, uh, all parts of our business uh, of um, having a struggle, but it's been, been, been preparedness. And I think uh, if you look back a less, uh, in terms of lesson, there's, there's a couple there. One, we need to plan for the future and be better at it. And the other one is we need, we need to look after our staff. That, that, that's pretty much uh, uh, where I think uh, uh, we need to go. Um, now, let's see who's next. Uh, Sir John, please may I ask uh, uh, lessons? Well, I, I think, as I said earlier, in every crisis, you must urgently act and uh, first of all, plan your survival if it's very severe. And secondly, shape your business for future competitiveness. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, Margaret. Um, I think it's about everybody having a common goal and understanding what that common goal is. So everybody's pulling together as a team. And I think the other thing is as well, I think, I work in a, a team which we are at various different areas in the country, so we naturally work from home. And it's the first time that some of us as, as consultants have worked at home on a permanent basis. A few of my colleagues were going in and out of our regional offices. But I think it's just being mindful that, yes, we, are, we all have the same common goal, but we are all part of one family. And to reach out 
to each other because to reach out gives us strength. We will give each other strength. And it's all about being, you know, that that reliability on each other. It's all about that reflective time. So learn from what we have done and we've done some things well. Um, just moving, just talking a little bit about John's team there, just picking up on that and John's, you know, guys who were in the thick of it. I, my, some of my colleagues work on the advice line and they were dealing in the beginning of this with up to 600 calls a day with, you know, 40 people taking the, the majority of those calls. So I think it's, it's resolve and I think it's just, you know, building that resolve in people as well and just have the people got the right skills and it's the soft skills as much as anything you know the comms the, and everything else that goes with it and how um, empowering people as well to be entrepreneurial and to speak up for the greater good of the future thank you margaret martin yeah and, and i suppose what, one thing and i'm just listening to your question in terms of you know what i've probably realized over the last number of months Many of our employees, not many, I say quite a portion of our employees, you know, that have come back to work motivated, but they've now put more a perspective on life. And, and a lot of that's driven, you know, because of the pandemic, you know, maybe they had a family member they've lost or family members that got sick. So, you know, people's priorities is important, as, as we all know. But, but I think the one thing is, you know, we, we've heard this old phrase, like sometimes a change is as good as a rest. And people want to progress. So I think to motivate employees, it's important that we, if either individually or our team, speak to each employee individually. Is there somewhere else in the organization do they have ambition to, to change roles? Because we have found there's been a number of employees have that burning appetite to change roles. And I think as organizations, if we don't give our employees the opportunity of progression within we're going to lose them skilled employees to other organizations. So I think it's to try and find time to listen to individual employees is going to be important after this pandemic. And hopefully it'll help to cover any, any other scenarios that, that may occur to our organization. So. Thank you. Uh, Stacey. Um, be agile um, as a business. Uh, look for areas that you can diversify to plan if there's any issues in the future or even for your own growth as a business. But really for us, uh, for us, we it became very clear to us that our uh, employees were the key to our business and our business success um, throughout the pandemic and beyond. Thank you. And, and Jonathan. Well, Actually, I think uh, it's me anyway, this, always be optimistic. I think it's very easy to uh, sit there staring at the problem, saying, woe is me. Very little is achieved with that. Um, if somebody's going to come and repeat the problem, they're not helping you. If they're going to come with potential solutions, that's what you need to encourage. So uh, I, I would always encourage anybody in, in our team um, okay, so we know what the problem was. What do you think we can do about it? And 90% uh, of people have really good ideas and really do want to be optimistic. If you, and I do like Sir John's phrase, you know, it's a privilege to be a leader. It really is. But I also recognise Ian's uh, perspective, and I think Martin as well, that managers aren't natural. You're not, very few people are a born leader. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I, you know, I think the phrase is nonsense, frankly. You learn your skills of leading by trial and error. And if you can help that by teaching leaders that in order to lead, you've got to be optimistic, you've got to be forward looking, you've got to have a solution, not a problem, then you'll, you'll teach them a lot and they'll think in a different way. So optimism, I'm very optimistic as a person. Uh, I, I, my view is uh, very little is achieved otherwise. Um, and we've had a great discussion. I want to thank you all very much. I've learned, I've learned a load, uh, a load from, from all of you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm not seeing any burning questions. So at this point, I would like to say thanks very much um, and good night. <laughs>